It's my Greek fisherman's hat. What do you think? That's uh, I, official. <laughs> hmm. Well, we come to the last session together. Um, at the end of uh, today, we're going to do a, a meditation, uh, which I will explain and talk about and get comfortable. Um, there, was, um, there was a time that something happened to me in my life uh, when I was uh, 21 years old uh, that uh, gave me an insight uh, that, that um, that I was much more powerful than I had ever thought than I was, and that I had um, a, a capacity within me to do things that um, no one had ever explained to me before, no one had ever told me before. It happened on several occasions in my life. Well, one of them was when I was at my father's grave um, at the age of 34, when I really t turned in my life around that day. Uh, from the direction that it was going, and had it go in a different direction. When I was able, when I learned the power of forgiveness, and was able to forgive this man for uh, leaving, and all of the mistreatment and so on that he had had uh, on his family. And as I've told you earlier, I've just uh, I spent the summer, uh, this past summer, from June through August. Uh, just in a uh, in the same kind of a frenzy that um, uh, that Rumi sp speaks about in his relationship to Shams. I was just looking at a book here today. I read this whole book today. <laughs> uh, this since early this morning. It's uh, Rumi, uh, the Glance, Songs of Soul Meaning. I may read some of those later, but there's 90 poems in there all about his relationship to Shams. Um, and <clears throat> I've kind of had that same kind of a relationship uh, to, uh, to my source, to God, if you will. To um, Mariam, who, who you met in, uh, in Turkey, and the two locations, which is still, I still haven't sort of recovered from. Uh, you didn't get to see our, our departure. Um, I came up to the, I came back to the ship and went upstairs to my uh, cabin, and I had one copy of uh, Wishes Fulfilled with me, and I wanted to uh, make sure that she got it because you can't get it in Iran. Um, those kinds of books can't be mailed there yet. They have to be, people have to bring them in. And um, are those, oh, thanks, Nancy. Oh, Dane did that. Um, so seeing her there <clears throat> was a very, very emotional thing. But when we, when we, I, I went, back down, got off the ship again. The ship was leaving in 30 minutes, so she was waiting. Um, and I noticed that they don't wait. I don't know if you have, have you noticed that? That's an amazing thing, because they take your passport, <laughs> and then they leave. <laughs> and I always wonder, but somebody must get left now and then. That's 25,000 people on these cruises, 10 cruise boats, and 2,500 on each one. Where do you go? You don't have a, t a passport. It's an interesting um, concept that they've come up with, <laughs> isn't it? Or if somebody got sick, say, on, on, on land and had a heart attack or had a stroke or had an accident, and these things must happen, and they take you off to a hospital and the ship leaves with your passport. Well, did you? Well, I don't know. Anyway. <laughs> I just noticed that when they say they leave at 1900, that doesn't mean 1901. <laughs> it's gone. And if you're not on it, uh, I don't know how they would get your passport to you. But anyway, that's a logistical question that I don't want to have to deal with. Anyway, I went back down to the uh, gang, 
plank and went down to the gang plank gangway and went down to the uh, and met with her and she was um, sobbing. I mean, like tears coming out of her eyes and her nose was all. I mean, she was. It was just and she was, couldn't catch her breath because she had never imagined that she, we would ever meet. Um, and then the last words she said to me were, uh, now I have to be alone again. And um, I was just profoundly moved by that. And when she was, uh, when she was two years old, uh, she uh, contacted uh, polio. And she didn't walk from two to seven at all. One of her legs is uh, about that much shorter than the other and very thin. So, uh, but she never talks about it. I, I just knew this because we had talked about it many years ago. And what happened when she was seven is that she had a dream. And in the dream, there was a woman, and she didn't know who the woman was, but I just thought it was fascinating and um, mystical that we were at the uh, home of, uh, of the Virgin Mary. <laughs> at the time of our meeting here and, and doing this whole thing, and that she had dreamt of a woman, like a, just a spiritual woman, who in her dream had told her that she could walk. And in her dream she walked. She just stood up and she walked as a, as a young child. And then she woke up and she walked. And she walked ever since. And you'd never even know it. I mean, she didn't even slow down. I mean, I, I could see her limping because she wore these garments that cover her legs and so on. But uh, um, that relationship and that I, that idea that um, from that poem I have quoted to you, uh, Samuel Taylor Coldridge. I did, didn't I? Here in this group, what if you slept? Mm. And what if in your dream you awoke? So I held a great big flower, and what if when you awoke you held that flower in your hand, that all, oh, what then? There was an awareness that this is a, this is a possibility, that, that these kinds of things are uh, not just fanciful kinds of dreams, but they're, you know, Rumi has this one poem, I don't have it exactly right, but it's like he says, I, you, he, she, they, these are distinctions that do not exist in the garden of the mystics, in the garden of the mystics. So that in mystical consciousness, in the, in the fifth dimension, um, the fifth density, um, there are no they's, there are no he's, there is no individuals, it's all one. There's just a oneness that is there. So I go back to being 21 years of age, and um, I was stationed on uh, Guam, uh, in the Marianas Islands, uh, in the United States Navy. Uh, I had been on board an aircraft carrier for the previous two years and was transferred off of there for my last 18 months of duty um, at the Naval Communications Station there. I was a cryptographer um, and radio and communication specialist, uh, enlisted, and um, second-class petty officer, RM2. <laughs> and. <clears throat> Because we were living in the tropics, there is um, something that happens, um, it happened a lot there. It's uh, men, especially young men under the age of 25, develop something, um, I've looked this up and researched it because I just wrote about it, because this I, I see as one of the significant points in my life and relevant to what I want to speak about today. Um, so I developed something called a polynidal cyst. Um, and that's a cyst that grows at the base of the spine, right at the tailbone, at the coccyx, right there. And it's a, it's about to be about this big and so on. And generally, um, they have to do sort of a minor surgery, surgical procedure. They, and it happens because of the tropic, the, the, the climate that there. There's an enormous amount of humidity. If you'd left your shoes out for two nights under your bed on Guam, they would be green. Uh, such was the humidity there, I mean, <laughs> and I was there for, like I said, the last 18 months of my life, of my uh, tour, which was that life. <laughs> um, 
So uh, I was stationed over at the Naval Communication Station, a place called Diddy Do, <laughs> and the Naval Hospital was in a town on the other side of the island called Agana, which is the capital of Guam. So I was developing this thing and it was getting more painful each day and it was getting larger and it hurt and I couldn't sit down and it, and it was one of these, and I didn't know what it was and I went to the infirmary and they said, you've got a polynidal cyst that happens here a lot, you're going to have to go to the hospital and you're going to have to have surgery. It's a minor surgery, but um, you'll still you'll have surgery, you'll be there for a couple of days um, and then you'll come back. So I went over there on a Friday afternoon and they had scheduled me for Monday morning to have this surgery that's put me in the hospital over the weekend. And um, while I was in the hospital there in Agania, they, um, they had a whole ward of young men who had these, developed these polynidal cysts on their, on their tailbone. So, um, I was assigned, and, I, and so I was an enlisted man in the, in the Navy, so you don't just lay around, you have to perform some kind of duty, whatever it is. And So my duty was to, to work with the people who had already had this surgery, and I had to dress wounds, I had to give, help them take these what they call sitz baths, I had to take certain kinds of ointments and so on, and put it on the place where they had cut it. And, and, uh, and that was my job for the, for the weekend. There was about 12 or 13 men uh, in this ward, with the polynidal cyst ward. So I get over there and this guy comes in and uh, he sort of bends over and uh, I look and they had taken, the, cut away from at the top of his uh, rectum and cut this way so that a big portion of either side of his buttocks had been removed and there was this mess <laughs> there and I had to take this uh, ointment and put it on there and then uh, put him in help him get into the bath because he had trouble walking and then um, then they put uh, bandages on it and we had to do this every f four hours every six hours whatever it was I don't remember all the details but I remember um, I remember what that looked like and I was told this was a minor little surgical procedure but this was a group of uh, Navy doctors, many of whom had been uh, drafted, um, and they were young, in their 20s and so on, and they were, uh, they were surgery happy. That's all I can say. I mean, they just, they, they wanted to do these surgeries. This was something that um, they were, this was part of their training. They were, they were in training, cutting away, Soldiers asses <laughs> or sailors asses and uh, so I uh, and there were soldiers there too. There were Marine Corps there as well um, So I took care of this one guy and then another guy came in and his was pretty bad too And then a third guy and the third guy was really bad. I mean they had really done a lot of cutting um, Now I've researched this and it says you don't have to do all of this in what it says on the internet, but What do I know? Um, so that was uh, Friday and Saturday and Sunday. This is what I did. And Sunday, I was scheduled for Monday morning uh, for them to do this surgery on me. Well, this was before I was 21. I was 20 years old. And uh, no, I was, I was 21. It's before, I just want this to be accurate. I'm recording this. It was before I was 22 years old. Um, and I um, went to bed that night on Sunday night and decided that I was not going to have this surgery. And not only did I decide that I was not going to have this surgery, but I decided that I was not going to have this polynidal cyst any longer either, that I was going to cure it. I was just a 21-year-old sailor, That's, um, and, but I was, I was a different than most of the sailors there. I was teaching, actually teaching a course there uh, in philosophy. Um, which just intrigued me at that time. And, um, <clears throat> and I was also preparing to go to the university because I went into the Navy right out of high school. Never in a million years did I think I'd be going to a university. No, nobody in my family ever had, nobody in my neighborhood ever had. Uh, we all we were in Detroit. They went to work at, in the uh, 
and the automobile companies, which were General Motors or Ford or Chrysler, and that became their careers. Um, and I was getting myself ready, so I was reading all the time and studying all the time and taking the uh, entrance exams to different universities and so on that I wanted to go to when I got out. Um, so I just went to, uh, I went to bed that night and I just meditated and I, I did it for, I think I meditated all night long. And all I did in my meditation was I just saw myself as healed. I just, I didn't hope that I would get healed. I, there was no prayer involved in this. It's interesting. I told you about Ellen DeGeneres and uh, her mother. And yesterday I, afternoon, I turned on the TV and there was Ellen. <laughs> I don't know. Has anybody seen Ellen here in, in, their, in their room here? Her show was on. Did you see? It was the actual, it was yesterday's show. It wasn't like an older show. And I thought, oh my God, Ellen, again. She just, I just talked to her, just talked to her mother. And um, so it reminded me I wanted to call her mother back. So I, I waited till the right time around 9 o'clock last night, which is around 1 o'clock in the afternoon in California. And I picked up the phone and I called Betty. And she told me how much she was reading Wishes Fulfilled, how much better she was feeling. But she said, I, I really have trouble saying I am healed because it still hurts so much in the mornings. And, and I started to tell her, that's the point. <laughs> You've got to be able to say, I am well, I am healed, and forget the evidence of what your senses tell you and what the medical records tell you, what everybody else is telling you. In your imagination, you have to see yourself as already healed. But I got cut off. <laughs> the phone went out. You know, we were at sea, and it was just uh, so um, I couldn't get, I haven't been able to get back to her. But she did say she was doing much, 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 much better with her broken back. So, um, and it's very hard for us to do this, but for me at the age of 21, something was telling me, something was directing me and telling me, this is what you are to do. Um, and I had never had any instruction in this. I'd never taken a course in, medica in meditation. Uh, it, it was a whole new um, thing for me, but the, the idea that I was going to let these sort of surgery happy young guys who were going to, using this as sort of their training ground, uh, uh, cut me in such a way that I could really be impaired. I mean, the guys that I was, I just didn't see how that was all going to come back, how they were going to be normal again after this, after something that is not supposed to be anything other than a, a minor surgical procedure. Um, and I had made up my mind that I was just not going to let them do it, even if they have to court-martial me. <laughs> There's no way I'm going to allow this to take place. So I went to bed that night and meditated on it and saw it and at first, you know, because I had been able to see it with a mirror, what this thing looked like. Um, and when I got up in the morning and I put the mirror back here and looked to see, there was nothing there. It, it was gone. And when I went, when they came to get me to take me into the, surger, the surgical room where they were going to give me this anesthesia and all that, I said, no, I don't have that. Um, it's, uh, we parted company. I don't have a polynidal cyst any longer. They said, oh no, absolutely, and they were going to do it anyway. <laughs> because I was, in the, I was in the Navy and you know, I was just a little enlisted man and they can do whatever they want with you. you they owned you. And I absolutely had to, I had to almost fight my way out of that, uh, out of that hospital and onto the, uh, I took a, a, a cab a Navy cab back to the base, which is about 20 miles the other side of the island, um, and just walked away from it and said, you're just absolutely not going to do it. But what I remember about that incident is that it, it, it uh, injected me with an, uh, with a, an awareness that um, if, if we really want something bad enough, bad enough so that what it is that we are wanting is um, is already here, and I think that's when I learned what I'm talking about. What I wrote about in Wishes Fulfilled, like 50 years later or whatever it is uh, later, um, that it is it's it, it starts with that uh, that awareness that within us we have to be able to say that I am healed and I have the capacity, the ability to to be able to do that. And since that time, in uh, in my own life, I very, very seldom had anything to do with the medical community. Um, 
and, and my children will tell you <laughs> that uh, whenever there's anything, I always tell them to first, you know, just think about healing this yourself before you go off and have them start doing all of their prodding and, ex you know, and, uh, and, and looking. And, and then if you break your arm or if you break your leg or if you, uh, you know, have some, something that happens, you just go in. Of course, modern medicine is a, is a wonderful thing. But there's, as Deepak always used to say, there's a uh, pharmacy inside each and every one of us that is capable of manufacturing and creating from our thoughts whatever drugs that our body needs. And um, one of the things I write about in, in Wishes Fulfilled is, this, um, is something called German New Medicine, which is this whole idea that um, every disease process that we have going on in our bodies is really um, our body's way of healing. Now this is true of things like cervical cancer. I mean, Louise Hay, who is the founder of Hay House and dear close friend and colleague, a woman I love very, very much, who I admire enormously, who at the age of 60, um, and if you think you're too old, you know, for any of this information, at the age of 60, she wrote a book called You Can Heal Your Life, channeled it, and today is the CEO and owner of uh, the largest uh, publishing house in the world of spiritual and higher consciousness materials from the age of 60. Um, <clears throat> and she was, uh, and she writes about this, so I mean, she, she was raped when she was a young girl, and she developed cervical cancer later in her life. And didn't take, you know, rocket science to figure that there's, there's a connection here between what happened to her and where it showed up in her body. And she began to listen to that and to begin to see. And in, in GNM, one of the things they say is that um, leukemia, for example, the thing that I was diagnosed with, is um, a body's way of healing. And that, um, and it's healing from unresolved um, traumas, generally related to um, relationship issues, relationship to parents, relationship to siblings, relationship to lovers, um, spouses, and so on. And, uh, and when these are unresolved and these behaviors persist in our lives, that um, the disease process that shows up in the form of elevated white counts and so on, is really the body's way of absolutely healing these traumas that we've carried around with us. And if we can go within and get these traumas healed and, and go to that place of divine love within, within ourselves and, and really come to that place, then um, these, these diseases begin to dis dissolve and disappear. It's like the example I use in the book is that if you were to cut your, let's say you had a bad cut on your arm and you cut your arm and you just watch what happens. And the body starts to uh, uh, send all kinds of weird things to that place in that cut. And the scab forms and, and pus will show up in there and then it gets all red and little funny marks come on and, and weird stuff comes out of it. And if you just were to look at that thing on your arm and in that state, you would say, oh my God, we got to cut that out, that whole mess there that is out. But in fact, that, uh, that scab and that pus and that, all that redness and so on and the swelling and all of that is the body's way, it's just the body's way of healing. And this is often, very, very often true. I mean, uh, Christian Northrup, a dear friend of mine who's a Hay House author, has written so many wonderful books, medical doctor, talks about uh, you know, these uh, pap tests and things like this, and that you can have a test one time and then go in a month later or two months later, what, and, and it's, it shows it normal again. And that the, the body's way of healing, very often cancer itself, uh, is, is the body's way of healing. And instead of just going in and just having this approach where we just cut everything out and, uh, and, and, or, or, or give it uh, heavy doses of uh, things where you have to run from the cure, <laughs> you know, that uh, as Deepak says, with chemotherapy, it's 50-50. And um, very often, I mean, 50% 50, 50 chance if you in, just inundate your body with this kind of massive poison, it's the, it's, it's the treatment rather than 
what it is trying to do. Sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. I don't know. I don't have the answers on any of this. Um, I, just, I just know that miracles are possible. And I also know that anything going on in our bodies that we think of as a disease process, fevers, you know, all of the kinds of things that you're dealing with and so on, that um, very often this is the body's way of healing some conflict that is going on, that's been going on since you were a child, and maybe, who knows, from previous lifetimes as well, you know. And that if we can go within and, um, like I, I, I love that quote of Melville from Moby Dick, you know, for as this appalling ocean surrounds the verdant land, so in the soul of man lies one insular Tahiti, full of peace and joy, but encompassed by all of the horrors of the half-lived life. I've said it before, I'll say it over, and I've said it so many times. There is a place of peace and joy deep within us, a place of peace. And that when we're able to go to that place um, and, and remove all of these traumas and all of the struggles that we've carried with us for a lifetime, we can, um, we can heal ourselves. I mean, it's certainly possible. You can heal your life. I have a friend who, several friends who are medical doctors, um, and one friend who has a practice, a big practice, an internist, has admitted to me on, on several occasions, she said, uh, about 75% of the time, when I am sitting across from a patient and they're telling me about their symptoms and what is wrong, he said, um, I have no idea what is wrong with them. It's just all a big guess game. And he admitted to me that he has Louise's book, You Can Heal Your Life, in his desk. He never tells them. <laughs> And he just goes through, and if they have various kinds, whether it's in the kidney or whether it's the pancreas or whether it's the liver, or whether, you know, whatever areas that they are experiencing discomfort, he will go in and, uh, and read them and then just talk to his patient about these kinds of things. And invariably, it will, you know, people who have lower back things. I struggle with lower back. I was in a relationship at one time um, that was just a struggle for me, and it's like, and I found that when I was with this person, as much as I loved this person and so on, I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't walk. It was like I would, I would get about, I'd go a hundred yards and my leg and my lower back would just seize up. And this was going on continuously. Now I've been an athlete my whole life. I've run seven marathons. I've, you know, I had a 22 year streak of running every day, eight miles, every day. Not missed one day in 22 years. Um, so I've been a, an active person. I swim every day now as you, and uh, do yoga every day and walk every day and uh, it's just a way of life with me. Yet here I was in this place where I just couldn't walk. I would get, I'd get 500 yards from my home and I would seize up and I'd have to sit down day after day after day. And I looked and you can heal your life. <laughs> And when you have that lower back thing, it's like, um, and when your leg, especially when you can't, it's like, an, an in, what is an in, inability to move forward? And it shows up physically with an inability to move forward in my life. I had things that I knew that I needed to do in my life. And I found I wasn't able to do them because of restrictions that I was feeling in this, in this relationship. And as that began to heal, and I began to work away from that, my leg healed up, and I'm back walking five, six, ten miles a day, doing yoga, swimming. Um, there's something to all of this. And as I said, many people that I know who are medical professionals will look in that book. That's one of the classic books ever written. And Louise, for those of you who don't know Louise, she's just... She always says, I'm just a simple woman with a simple message. And then my message is just something that just came to me. I mean, she was just, uh, she, was a, she was a dancer. And just, a, you know, a, your average woman. Very attractive young woman and went through these traumas in her life, which you can read about in her books. And, and she's, an, she's an icon today. She's uh, someone... I have, and she's 86 years old, and she was just with me in London and Scotland and, and Australia, and 
on stage doing these things at, at 86. Amazing. She's already planning next year's schedule. She says, I'm cutting back. I'm only going to do six of these I can do it instead of nine or whatever. Uh, but she's 86. I see people 86 at where my mother lives and you know, they've already given up on themselves. They've already, you know. So, um, a lot of people, I've, anyway, what, what, the reason I wanted to start with that story and tell it is because there's a song I've often played, it's called It's In Every One Of Us. It's in every one of us to be wise, open up both your eyes, we can all see, it. you know that song, it's a great song, anyway, I'm, I'm not a great singer, but it's a great song. Uh, and that's what I want to say to you, that, it's, that if it's in me, it's in you. You know, that because we all come from the same place and we all return to the same, we all have inside of us. And if I were to just ask you to pick a number between one and 90 and I read one of those poems, you would see that he's talking about this, this divine love that's in, it's in every one of us. It was one that I was reading this morning. There, this is from Rumi. There are no words to explain, no tongue, how when the player touches the strings, it's me playing and being played. How existence turns around this music, how stories grow from the trunk, how cup and mouth swallow each other with the wine, how a garnet stone from nowhere is puzzled by these miners, <laughs> How even if you look for us hair's breadth by hair's breadth, you'll not find anything. We're inside the hair. How last night a spear struck, how the lion drips red, how someone pulls at my robe of tattered patches. It's all I have. Where are your clothes? How shams of trees lives outside time. How what happens to me happens there happens everywhere. There's nobody like Rumi. <laughs> One more. You don't mind? Did you enjoy the r reading of, of, of the... Um, I don't know if you know how much I put into that, but um, I spent months preparing for that one hour. And then to have it show up, the, the talk was moved at the last minute um, to that place. And then to find out that it was Rumi's birthday. <laughs> And then to have Mariam show up, unexpected, all at once, um, I, I, still, I still am shuddering in amazement at it. This one's called Hoofbeats. The sound of hoofbeats when leaving a monastery, where all is timed and measured. You are the rider, someone who does not care very much about things and results, illness or loss. You are the soul inside the soul that's always traveling. Mind gathers bait. The personality carries a grudge. You weave cloth like the moon leaving no trace on the road. There's a learning community where the names of God are talked about and memorized. <laughs> and there's another residence where meanings live. You're on your way from here to there and don't claim you're not carrying gifts. Your graceful manner gives color and fragrance. As creek water animates landscape, it moves through. Hundreds of caravans still into the sky. You travel alone, by yourself. Those caravans, sun inside one dazzling moat, the emperor's serenity on night watch, as alert as his palace guard. You enchant this invisible place so that we imagine you're going somewhere off to new country. The absolute unknowable appears as spring and disappears in fall. Signs come, not the essence signified, how long will you be a shepherd, single filing us in and out of this human barn? Will I ever see you secretly as you are in silence? I'm uh, inviting um, my sweetheart, um, 
who's here with me on this trip to come up and uh, share a few words with you, my beautiful daughter. Um, because so many people have asked her, she said, Dad, they just always ask me. I said, well, then maybe would you mind hearing from Serena a little bit about um, what it's like to be around these ideas and grow up with them. She's writing a book. It'll be out next year. It's called uh, Don't Die With Your Music Still In You. And it's, um, it's about what it felt like to be raised around these crazy ideas with a crazy father like this. <laughs> so Serena, honey, come on up and uh, say a few words to these people. Is there another mic? Oh, here, let me get it for you. You relax, honey. I'll get it with my back, my sore back. <laughs> Stand still. I'm very... <laughs> Don't you just love how he calls me up like this? <laughs> I told him that um, we were walking the other day and I told him that a lot of people have been um, asking me, they, I, I get this all the time, is he really like that? You know, is he really the kind of father that he seems like he is on stage or does he really live what he talks about? And, um, or sometimes they say, does he embarrass you or is he weird or do you get upset when he calls you up on stage? And um, the truth is that he, 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 people come from all over the world to see him, to hear him, not because he puts on a good show, because he really is um, giving off the love and spirit that he talks about up here. And I don't know about you guys, but when... Uh, when Mariam was on the stage with him, I just kept crying and crying. There was a woman that was sitting next to me that was like giving me tissues because I was crying so hard. Because to see 27 years of love for somebody that's my dad, I mean, it's like, the, it's, like it's just an amazing thing to be a part of. And this is how he always is. I mean, Mariam might have been like an isolated incident that some of you guys got to see, but for me, I see this all the time. I can't tell you the number of times in Maui, I'll be like loading the dishwasher, and he's bringing three people in. And it's like, oh, Serena, I just met these people on the sidewalk, and they heard me speak in Seattle, and they wanted to get a children's book. I'm like, okay, hi, guys. Like, this happens like at least once a day. Or we'll be walking somewhere on the sidewalk, in Maui and someone will come up to us and say, I was just thinking about you. I wanted to, to see you or I've been wanting to meet you. I moved to Maui and I hoped I could meet you. And he brings them inside and then we like have dinner with them. And I mean, it, it just shows me that when you really live in this space and you live, you really live this message, it's not like, you know, little miracles happen from time to time. It's like, coincidences or alignments or whatever you want to call them. They're just an everyday part of, of his life and my life as his daughter. And um, I mean, I had a couple years ago, my best friend in the world, Lauren, her mom has a, or had a, a brain tumor and she was going to have surgery on her brain. And my dad called her the night before the surgery and said, this is what you're going to tell the doctors, and this is the energy you're going to go in there with, and this is what you're going to think. And she did. She told the doctors not one negative word is allowed to be spoken in the operating room where I'm being operated on. And the doctor said afterwards that he didn't know what happened in that room, but he was so overcome with peace that it was one of the best surgeries he's ever had. And after that, Lorraine, when she was getting chemo, she would play the song Burn Baby Burn in her headphones while she was getting chemo and other patients complained that it wasn't a laughing matter and it wasn't something to, to be making a joke over. And my dad said, you're completely wrong. And if you can't laugh through the storms of our lives, then, well, I don't know. You just got to be able to laugh, I guess. So, um, yeah, that was pretty much all I wanted to say, that 
that yes, he is really the living, breathing example of what he talks about on here. And in my mind, I don't think of him as a guru. I don't think of him as like. Excuse me. <laughs> I don't. I don't think of him as like this, you know, um, person that has these miracles happen for him because he's better or different than you or I. I think he just stays connected to his message. And that's why these things happen for him um, all the time. And for me, when I go on a trip like this, it's like hitting the reset button in my own life because this is my second one this year and I go home and I know that my connection to my source gets like a little bit more rusty. I'm, I find myself being more judgmental or critical of people around me or I find myself looking for answers outside of myself even though I was raised to know that all of the solutions to every problem is within me but I lose sight of it a little bit and then I come on a trip like this and I hear him speak six times in 12 days and it's like I hit the reset button and I just feel like oh that's right I am God it is God that looks out from behind my eyes and I can do anything with this knowing so you had uh You had um, a friend um, who just went through a very traumatic uh, event, and her, was it her mother? That her mom, mom, yeah. You tell them about what happened there. That was amazing. On August 3rd, I got um, a call from my friend that was my closest friend at Arizona State. Her name's Kristen. And Kristen called me, and she was hysterical because her mom has Parkinson's, and her mom has had Parkinson's for about two years, but um, she took a really bad turn for the worse. She got pneumonia and was put into the hospital and then she couldn't really keep a breathing tube and she couldn't take a feeding tube and she had withered a, a really small amount of weight and um, Kristen was just like hysterical and Kristen's mom always um, would go with me to his talks when he would speak in Arizona so she said to me will your dad call my mom she's in ho oh she had just been moved to hospice and they told her she had about five days so I called him and he said, of course, I'll call her mom. So he spoke with her mom on the phone and um, what they really wanted was for her to take the feeding tube. And he, he talked to her about how, well, I don't know, I wasn't on the phone, what did you say? It doesn't matter what I said, but... Um, he, I, I know afterwards because I, mean, I talked to Kristen. I know exactly Kristen. what I said, but I, I don't think that's... But he, he, I talked to Kristen afterwards and basically her mom agreed to take the feeding tube after he had talked to her and um, he also told her to get Dying to Be Me, Anita's book, so Kristen did and she read it to her out loud in two days and um, um, she was moved out of hospice four days later and she is home and she goes in for physical therapy appointments a few times a week but she's gained her weight back and basically she needed to survive until September because September was the month that she was able to get this um, stem cell treatment and she got it so a lot of people here um, are parents and they uh, wonder like can you <clears throat> what's it like to raise your kids on, on these kinds of ideas um, was our house different than your friends houses and uh, I mean yeah <laughs> obviously <laughs> Like, for example, every summer on Maui, we all went to our friend Frederick's house, who was a monk, and we meditated and chanted Om, and <laughs> ate mung beans. And when I was five, I was taught transcendental meditation, and I had a mantra, and I went to a Christian school for 10 years, and, you know, I would be told in the classroom that in order for, I had religion class first thing in the morning every day and I was told that in order to get to heaven you had to be baptized and you had to accept Jesus Christ as your one and only savior. So this was like very distressing for me because we had Buddhas in my house and I knew about the Torah and I knew about um, Krishna and I knew about the Bhagavad Gita starting from a very early age and I would go home and say, Dad, you really shouldn't say that um, you know, these are all uh, manifestations of one God. These are all the same because you're going to go to hell. 
and he would, you know, say to me, ask your teachers about that. Ask your teachers, raise your hand and ask these questions because I was being told one thing at home and another thing in the classroom, but the truth is that what I was hearing at home felt good and it felt right. And it, when he told me that, I remember actually I cried one time in my religion class because I said to my teacher, um, but what about those kids that never got to meet a Christian and those kids were never um, taught about Jesus? Is it their fault? Are they going to have to go to hell? And she would say, you know, I, I don't really know about that, but I just know Jesus is the only way to heaven. And I would just be so worried about this. And my dad would say, just don't pay attention to any of that. You are God and so are they. And don't believe in any of this heaven or hell. Heaven is just a state of mind. It's not a place that you're going. It's just a state that you live in. So, yeah, our house was really different. And no, he doesn't embarrass me, actually. Even when he calls me up on stage unannounced, it doesn't really embarrass me. Um, there are certain things he says that I don't like hearing him say, like things about sex, but... I don't get embarrassed by him because he's always been this way. And he's always danced to the beat of his own drum more than anybody that you can imagine. I mean, if they said that you had to wear a black tie to a wedding, he showed up like this. And nobody cared. So he's always been different. And it's the only dad I've ever known. So it doesn't embarrass me. Those of you who, is anybody would like to ask uh, Serena anything um, as parents or... Yeah. Why did we send her to a Christian school when we were teaching something different at home? Um, they were in public school, and um, one of my daughters had bruises uh, in the vaginal area, um, and she, we had found out that they were bringing kids into the school, and they were, um, she was only, uh, I think Summer was like six or five, six years old or something, and and this was f a fairly regular thing that was going on in there. There was some abuse taking place in the school, and that was it. I just pulled them out of the school that day, and that was the only school within driving distance. We had five kids in eight years, so. Um, but then um, my daughter Sage um, was very disturbed by seeing a cross uh, in the chapel. This is a very good school, by the way, education school. The only part of it was the religion um, part. And I just thought, be exposed to all of that. Listen to that. You'll hear a lot of this in your life, and you'll have to make up your own mind about it. Um, and one of my daughters is very much into that. I'm, I don't care. It's not... Uh... But anyway, she, she came home, and she just said... Uh, she was all upset. She was, I think, five. Do we have to... Like, I just can't stand to go into chapel to see somebody there with... They showed the blood coming down and the whole thing. It was, a, and so I went to the principal and asked if she could be excused from going to chapel since she's, you know, we're not raising her that way anyway. And they said absolutely not. She has to go. So I pulled them all out. <laughs> uh, and we, they were building, they were creating a new school, uh, which was not religious oriented, and we put them in there. But I think being exposed to all of these ideas. Um, you know, I want each of them to make up their own minds, and I didn't want to raise them to be anything other than what they could be themselves. Any other, especially as parents, if you have any questions? Over there. Mm -hmm. Can you, can you hand, someone hand her a mic? Yeah. Oh, yeah, come to the mic if you have a question. We'll just take a few more minutes on this. I just wanted to ask Serena if it validated you to be able to cha challenge that when you were in class to be able to say, I'm not raised this way, and these are my ideas, did it give you a stronger sense of yourself? Um, definitely, and it, it also made me feel more aligned with um, being comfortable to, to trust what felt right for me. So even when my teacher would say something and I didn't agree with it, I knew that at home, my parents felt like it was okay for me to disagree. And so I felt really um, safe in myself in knowing that I could trust what feels right rather than what I'm being told is right and that my parents, my family would support that. And that's like the number one thing, that's the number one benefit of growing up with spiritual parents is that you grow up knowing that you're safe, 
that whoever you are and whatever you believe in and whoever you want to love and anything you want to think and any way you want to dress and anywhere you want to live, you're allowed to do that because who you are is a perfect creation of God, a piece of God, and nobody can tell you to do anything other than that without your permission. So it just made me feel like whoever I was was great. <laughs> Even though I felt questions at times like, am I really God? This is very dangerous for me to think this way because like, okay, I'm God, but I'm sorry, God, for saying that, but I am God, but I'm sorry. You know, <laughs> I would do that a lot, especially as a kid, but I always sort of knew I could go with what felt the best. And, and feeling like I was a little piece of God and not God's, like, enemy made me feel the best. Wait, and I apologize for the second question, no but problem. was it that you, you had an opportunity to go home to your parents and talk to them about that? that offered that security? I think so because um, I could tell them about anything and they just told me to trust what I was feeling inside. And so because I had a mom and a dad that told me that what I was feeling, what my intuition was telling me was right, it made me feel like it was okay then to disagree with the classroom or the teacher or the priest. You know, it just felt like they told me to just trust trust myself and so I did and um, I think that definitely helped because I had friends that um, their parents didn't tell them that they told them just listen to the teacher and try to fit in and don't ask such complicated questions and if the teacher doesn't know then stop raising your hand and I was just thinking like oh my god my dad says the exact opposite my dad's crazy <laughs> but it was the right thing thank you mm. okay any other any other thoughts Thank you, sweetheart. You're welcome. I'll take that one. We'll go over this presentation later, and I have a lot of things I want to talk to you about. You're deeply flawed in your way you presented it. <laughs> I have several other things to talk to you about before we do this meditation. Um, the next step on my journey, um, as I've told you, I, something just something that I was reading about in Rumi there, something that's in, that, that, that's inside the hair, <laughs> that um, got a hold of me, and and it was such an uh, exquisite feeling I, um, this summer to to know that um, I was being uh, I was. <clears throat> I, was, I met with Catherine this morning. We did a session this morning, and, and um, one of the things I said to her was that we, uh, you, you, you get to you, you get to a sense where you know that there's something, something moving these pieces around. You know, I mean, I've been the last four or five days. I've been waking up four o'clock, four thirty, and these these ideas have been hitting me. About and I, I wake up and I jump out of bed and I'm writing th these things down and and I, I've been contemplating how to how to do the next uh, step in my life after uh, I can see clearly now which hasn't even been edited yet and I'm on to the next thing I've got two books that I'm trying to combine into one um, and wondering how to project all of that and it's just there it's just there and I it's um, I think as we as we get more and more aligned with our, our source and just let ourselves just let ourselves be directed. I always say the Beatles had it right, that let it be is such such three such important words. Just let it be. Um, the um, there's just this awareness that I'm being that it's it's speeding up. Maybe it's because, you know, of my age at seventy two or the age of my body I should say. Um, and that's, you know, you only get so much time in this body to do what it is that you got to do. And so if you're aligned and you're staying there and you're in this place, um, you'll, um, you'll get the cues. It'll be there for you. It's like I said, I stress so, so often in all of these talks here, it's like, it's that following your excitement. It's, it's understanding the word enthusiasm. It's understanding passion. It's living from a place of passion. Every one of those 90 poems in there are about passion, 
but it's 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 not a it's not a sexual passion. It's a passion for it's not a a love a physical love passion. It's just a passion for for knowing your highest self, knowing the God that you are, and and as you allow yourself to experience that, boy, it just so. The, I, I told you earlier about the connection that I feel between uh, Rumi and Shams, Plato and Socrates, and um, and and <clears throat> and myself and Mariam, and and myself and um, Lao Tzu, and myself and um, Saint Francis, who I've written about and. Uh, Wishes fulfilled that I went through that whole how St. Francis came into my life and what he has meant to me and um, and then to find out that Francesco had been last year we were on a trip to Assisi this year we're in here and finding out that Shams and uh, and St. Francis had had a meeting and that they both did similar kinds of things you know that they used poetry and music um, and dance in in their uh, you know in movement in in their uh, in their teachings and that this whole idea i mean this the, this idea of being a whirling dervish that uh, rumi and shams with this and that whole feeling of what the dervishes are that as you get to this place where you can move your hands in a certain way and you dance and you, and the more of this that you do and as you do it this automatic writing just comes out of you it's just it's an exquisite feeling i've been practicing i've been even doing it um but this other person that I've talked to you about who uh, shared a space on this planet with me, who was born in the middle of the, of, uh, of the Civil War in the United States. You know, he was born in the middle of the Civil War in 1864, and we shared four years together on this planet. Think of that. Um, the connection here, the timeless connection there, and his name is Peter Dunoff, Peter Dunoff, the great Bulgar uh, who was responsible for making sure that not one Jew in Bulgaria was sent to a concentration camp because of him. And he did it in a moment, just in a moment, by naming the place where the Tsar was in hiding. I told you about that. So Peter Dunoff, as I have been studying Peter Dunoff, because when I did my past life regression with Mira, um, I... Um, I was Peter Dunov. I saw the photograph. I, at the minute that I saw it, I knew that uh, th this was more than just a, a a mental connection. It was he was a part of me. And as I read and watch and and, and looked at some of the film and he's got hundreds and hundreds of books, not that many in English, um, and they're all on divine love. So, and he had something called the panarrhythmia, which was they would dance up in the mountains of Bulgaria. Uh, and he would teach about this kind of love. And he said, and this is just what I want to go over quickly here before we move into the final part of this. And that is that, um, that there are three kinds of love. And this is really important. And it's, it's, this is what uh, this morning at, at 20 minutes to five, I was, um, I just had this aha moment. Oh my God, now I get it. Now I understand the difference between these three kinds of love. I was, I was always able to recite them before and give talks about them. I've even talked about them in a few of my more recent talks and I've even written somewhat about it. But this morning I understood it and I, after I did that, then I meditated on it for 45 minutes. Then I went downstairs onto the fifth floor and I, I walked and watched the sun come up this morning. It's this, if any of you have been able to see that, did you see it this morning? I mean, I'm like, you've got to get up and do that, you know. Um, one of Rumi's famous lines says, he said, uh, the breeze at dawn has secrets to tell you. Do not go back to sleep. Do not go back to sleep. Do not go back to sleep. Three times. The breeze at dawn has secrets to tell you. Do not go back to sleep. Do not go back to sleep. Do not go back to sleep. You have to talk to yourself like this because every part of your ego body says, I'm going back to sleep. It's only four o'clock in the morning. And every single one of us gets awakened between three and four o'clock virtually every single night. It happens to everyone. 
I mean, I don't even have to ask you to raise your hand. You are awakened. A lot of you think it's just because you're prostate and you're older and you got to pee, you know. And uh, <laughs> but it's uh, there's an awakening, and then it's like you wake up and I wrote the entire you. Um, Change Your Thoughts, Change Your Life book on the Tao. I wrote the entire thing between 2 o'clock and 5 o'clock in the morning. The entire thing. Because that's the time when there's less noise. And it's uh, Blaise Pascal, the famous French philosopher and scientist, said that all of man's troubles stem from his inability to sit quietly in a room alone. We'll be doing that soon. Meditation is such an important part of all of this, but this morning, I mean, when the way the ship was going, and I was going to walk up this way on the fifth floor, you can walk about the whole length of the ship, and then you turn around and you walk back on either side. One side is smoking, the other side is non-smoking. I go on the non-smoking side. And um, when I would walk back, I would rush real fast this way, so that walking back, I could just watch this big ball just, just coming up, looking, I was walking with a woman, she wasn't even in this group, and um, she didn't even, I don't think she even spoke English, and she was just saying, magnifico, 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 she was doing that, and I'd walk by it, and it just, um, so we were obviously facing east, it was, uh, so this, um, these three kinds of love are, um, The first one of them is called this, the first one of them is called human love, and um, human love is a love that has two characteristics to it, according to Peter Dunoff. One is that it changes, and two that it varies. Okay. So human love is generally the love that exists between two egos. The ego being the part of us that believes that who I am is my body, its possessions, its accomplishments, its reputation, and its disconnection to everything and everyone else, its separate, separateness from everyone else, its separateness from each other, its separateness from God. That's the ego. Um, and, and so this is a love that you have that, um, that changes. So that you can love someone and then you can not love them. Um, you can love um, someone and then it can turn to hate and vitriol and revenge and anger and end up in horrible situations and, and the ultimate of which of course is murder but um, up, up and down the line this changing this concept of love that changes is uh, is a very uh, it's very identifiable with the with with the human being with the humans kind of love um, and because it changes, it is um, never anything that you can rely upon. Um, so when someone says, I love you, um, you want some proof. And then you're wondering, what is it about me that you are loving, and what is it about you that I am loving? Is it because of what I do, what I have, what other people think of me, which is the ego's work all the time, isn't it? So that if you love someone, if someone says, I love you, yes, but, you know, do you love me because of what I can do for you? And then if I can't do it for you, are you not going to love me? And that's a very, very normal kind of what we call human love. If you stop being nice to me, if you stop, you don't send me flowers anymore. If you don't send me flowers or you don't do those things that you once did when it was a lustful kind of love, then, then the love isn't there anymore. And, and the way that we know that we love someone in this human form of love is on the basis of what they do for me. So the more that you do for me, the more prove to me that you love me. Um, and therefore, it is incumbent upon me to do something for you in order for you to feel that you are loved by me. So therefore, I must be constantly, it's, it's, it's a love that is doing, it's a doing kind of love. But 
but were not human doings. I watched the Iron Lady in my room the other night. And I watched another movie that I really encourage every one of you to watch if you, before you leave. It's on the free movies on demand. I suppose it probably won't be now that I say it. Everybody's going to talk. But it's, it's called uh, Extreme... What is it? Extremely Loud and Incredibly Close. Mm, wow. One of the better films I've seen in a long, 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 long time. Um, with Tom Hanks and Sandra Bullock and this young boy who's... It's an amazing boy. How many have seen that? You know, a lot of you have. It's on, in your, it's on in your room. It's an amazing film to watch. Anyway, in watching The Iron Lady, um, uh, Margaret Thatcher is saying, and this, Meryl Streep just became Margaret Thatcher. I mean, when the film opened, I said, I was on the phone with my daughter, I said, oh, they don't open the film, they're opening it with some original fit footage of Margaret Thatcher, and then they're going to go to the actual film. But it was Meryl Streep as Margaret Thatcher. She just she transforms herself into her. But anyway, one of the, and I wasn't the biggest fan of Margaret Thatcher, um, um, politically. I mean, I was just, when she gave the order to sink that battleship and a thousand people were sent to their death on it, I was, I, I was, I was devastated. Um, um, but um, she said, um, Everybody used to always do something. Everybody, we used to do things in our generation. We always did things. Now so everybody just wants to be somebody. Everybody just wants to be something. And, and she was saying that as a sort of as a criticism. And I got to thinking about that line. And, uh, and uh, I think being someone is maybe more important than, than doing something. We're, we're human beings. We're not human doings. Um, being someone meaning being aligned, being connected, being, being spiritual, being divine. Um, but anyway, we could go on and on with that. Um, where was I? There was... Yeah, I know the three different loves that are, but there was, a, I was somewhere in between. I love being able to ask now. At 72, you say, well, you know, it's just some of those moments, but... The, uh, that I all knew, but I was going somewhere else. But anyway, um, the movie, yeah. So this this um, this idea of uh, of a love that is changing continuously, and and so we need um, explanations, explications, definitions, proof. We need proof that you love me. You've got to prove that you love me. I mean, Serena will tell you. Where? Did Serena leave? Oh. Um, that um, one of the things that I have eight children, uh, and five and eight years, so real close in age, eight children. And if I would come home and I would give, here, maybe you can tell them, Serena. I would give them, uh, can you hand me that mic? I mean, this was a big lesson in, in our family. <laughs> Get up here. <laughs> so if I would um, come home and, and, and bring a gift for somebody or give money to one of them or whatever, um, my wife would often say, if you do it for one, you have to do it for all of them. You know, so if, but when you go on a trip and you got eight kids, <laughs> that's a lot of things. But I had one daughter who liked turtles, so if I saw a turtle, but now I don't have to, do I have to buy a camel, and do I have to buy an elephant, and do I have to buy, you know, from, come home with bags full of, so that whenever I give anything to one of my kids, uh, and the others look at it, like they didn't get it, but they did, what's the lesson? I mean, always. You should be happy for them. <laughs> and that's what we would say. I'm really, really happy that Sage got a gift this time. I've just been letting you know that I'm available for gifts too. <laughs> That's what we would say. <laughs> right. Or if Sage got, or Sage is younger than me, so, you know, I would say, Sage got a new car. I could not be happier for her. I mean, she needs a new car. I completely agree. Sage, I'm so happy for you. And he would say, that's right. You, you better be, too. <laughs> and that would be the end of it. And that would be the end of <laughs> right. it. Right. Okay. Thanks, honey. It's, um, 
so that the, that this idea of that you have to that the way I'm going to show you as your father that I love you is by giving you presents. You know, it's that whole kind of this is human love. This is really what it is. Human love is a changing phenomenon. And it requires all kinds of proofs, all kinds of identifications, and creates enormous difficulties, especially in love relationships, because you've just got to keep proving it, you know, and you've got to keep giving more. And, uh, and there are expectations that are associated with it. And when there's expectations, there's disappointments that are associated with it. Then there's upsets, and then there's divorces, and there's... Okay. So human love has two qualities. It is, one, it changes, and two, it varies. And a human love that varies is a love that um, is more intense sometimes than others. So, I love you, but not as much as I did yesterday. <laughs> or it's, uh, it, it just, sometimes it's hot, sometimes it's cold, sometimes it's, you know. So there's, this is what we mean by human love, and I could go on and on with that. I wrote a whole bunch about that this morning, this whole idea of ego human love. It's the lowest kind of love, according to Duna. Second kind of love is a love that is called uh, spiritual love. Spiritual love is a love that never changes, but it varies. That is, there are times in my life, and this is, I think, where I am in my life, in a place of spiritual love, uh, working towards the, <coughs> the next one the higher one, but um, almost always in this, at least in this place of, of spiritual love. That is uh, a love that um, is not ego-based, a love that uh, isn't going to change, um, but I sometimes feel it more, more intensely than other times. I feel it when I'm meditating in the morning. I feel that my strongest love for everyone and everything. Um, it's um, we get we get into this um, we, we we slip back into this human love, and I still do that. But the thing of it is, I slip back and I get it. I catch myself almost instantly. I'll give you an example. We were in um, where did we ride the donkeys? Santorini, okay. Ah, yes, Santorini. <laughs> and I think it was Santorini. I mean, we've been in so many places in the last week in different countries, but I, I think it was in Santorini. And I went into, um, into, the, one of the, into the bathroom, and there was, uh, no, it wasn't Santorini. It was another city. It doesn't matter. Um, and there was, so we went in and they have these urinals in there and you go in and the women are all standing in line and you, the men just go in and they come out and it's like one of the advantages. Um, and um, there's a man in there and he's taking, see, he's just p placed himself there. He doesn't have a uniform, he doesn't have anything. He's just, I guess, decided that this is going to be his work. This is how he's going to support his family, I guess. I don't know what he's doing in there, but he's taking the towels off of the thing in the wall uh, and handing them to the people as they wash their hands. And my human love sign says instantaneously, the ego part of me in there, I'm not tipping this guy for giving me something that I can perfectly do myself. I don't want to have to tip somebody for giving me a, 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 you know, a napkin to dry my hands, right? I mean, that's my instantaneous thought. It's just what I was raised on. It's that whole, I'm more important than, and this is, and why should, what, what, what is he doing in here anyway? And, and he's just there making me feel guilty, and I gotta see if I got money, and I don't know what kind of money they have here, and how much to give him, and do I give him a penny, or do I give him a hundred euros? What do I do with this guy, you know? And it's like, and I, I don't even want him to give me the napkin, because then I feel like I'm obliged to do something now, and you know, that whole thing. And it's, but this is all happens in five seconds. You know, it's five seconds. And then I stop myself and I remember who I am and I remember what this is all about and I think for a second about this man and that he's, um, um, you know, he's living over here and he's in a toilet and he's, you know, smelling piss all day long and he's, you know, he's, and it's like, and, 
you know, it, it, and I reach in and I give him a, a big something, something big. I don't remember even what it was, but it was a big bill. Um, because I don't even keep track of this stuff, you know, how much everything is and the exchange rates and all of that. I just, they're just green and blue and red and I just pass them out. And, <laughs> um, and I walk out of there remembering that he's, um, he's every bit as divine as Rumi <laughs> and as Shams and as any one of us, you know. And, you know, he's got a, who knows what his story is and what his life is like and why he's elected to spend his day in a toilet handing people paper napkins, you know. And I put my, I hand his hand and I hug him and tell him I love him. And uh, so it's like you catch yourself when you move from human love to spiritual love. It's not like it still doesn't show up. Another example of this happened when I was on Maui not too long ago and most of the time when I meet people and I'm on Maui, if, I, 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 <clears throat> if I'm near my home, I give them a copy of my film, The Shift, because I want 10 million people to watch it because I believe we can shift the consciousness of the world if I, we get a certain number of people, critical mass, hundredth monkey, all of that realignment stuff and so on. So I, this woman, I talked to her and she, I talked for a little while and I, and I, <clears throat> uh, invite her up to my, uh, on the second floor, and I have a, I guess this is, excuse me, and I go in and I get a popular of the movie and I give it to her, and I said, and, and Portia de Rossi's in it, and she's, uh, you know, a very well-known actress, and she's married to Ellen DeGeneres. In fact, I was blessed to marry them, you know, to officiate at their wedding, and, and she looked at me and she said, and you're all right with that? Now, there was a time when that would have been a rant. <laughs> and I would have been angry. And, it would be, and I would have given a speech, a good one, and a long one, a thrashing about why would any two human beings not have the right who love each other to have the same rights as everybody else. And you know the talk. I could go on and on and on here. Um, and um, that was a five-second retreat back to human love. And then I came back to spiritual love and I just said to myself, I love this woman as much as I love Portia, Ellen, my children, my mother, God, whatever. She's got God within her. And, and I said, I'm all right with just about anything. I said, I think you'll enjoy the film. And I left the encounter re thinking to myself how far I have come in that I can now love someone who um, doesn't see the world the way I see it. I can love her. And every time I see her, I wave to her and uh, I say, hi, I don't think she's seen the film. She probably won't watch it, but that's okay. I want her to see an example of someone who loves you regardless. It's a love that doesn't change, but it varies. It varies. It goes. But the love, and so it's like you catch yourself and you get into this place in your life where you find yourself having judgment, criticism, condemnation. Remember, the whole focus of the talk the other day was that in order for you to access divine guidance, the guidance of the angels, the miraculous guidance that is available to you, that will provide you and help you with manifesting anything you want in your life, the only way to do that is to be like they are. They have to recognize themselves in you. And that has to be a kind of spiritual love at least. And when they see that in you and it's consistent, that, uh, I mean, I can't tell you how many times, it's almost always when I'm in hotels and so on, that I just don't take the, one of the maids and just talk to them about their life a little bit. It's usually they're from another country, generally from South America or from Mexico or someplace, and they've been in America for, you know, working on the same floor of the same hotel for 27 years, you know. I put a, a, a woman's da daughter who d did something like that through college <laughs> from just encountering her. And I don't say that for credit, I just say that that's just like, but very often I will just 
lump a hundred dollars into them and say, get something nice for your, for your children or whatever. Because you can't, you know, in the Tao it says the person of Tao, which is a person of God, a, a man of Tao is kind to the kind and kind to the unkind because kindness is his nature, is his nature. Your nature has to be love. It will still, in spiritual love, it will still vary, but it never changes. And even if it does just vary to a point where you go back to that ego moment that I had in that, in that, in that toilet just recently, a few days ago, um, but I remembered when I walked out of there and I thought, almost like patting myself on the back and reminding myself, I, I didn't stay there. In fact, I walked away from him and then I had to go back and reach in and, and put, a, put some money in his hand and thank him and put my arms around him. I walked away and then came back. And it was in the process until you get to a point where you don't ever even think about walking away. That's who Jesus was. That's all they had to give away. So spiritual love is a love that never changes, but it varies. There's an intensity to it more than other times. The third kind of love, according to Peter Dunoff, is called divine love. And divine love is a love <clears throat> that never changes and never varies. It is always pure and it is always there. And there are no degrees of it. There are no up and downs of it. There are no gradations of it. It's the kind of love, said Peter Dunoff, that God has for us. Just a love. I accept you for who you are, what you are, what you do, how you think, and I'm willing to be in a relationship with you. And that's the kind of relationship I um, have always wanted in my life and have never been able to have. Not because there's somebody else out there who wasn't good enough, but because I wasn't. I just didn't know how to be that. I'm learning. I've always believed that true nobility, it's not about being better than anyone else. It's about being better than you used to be. And I can tell you for sure that on every measure that I know, I'm better than I used to be. But I still vary. It still, it still comes and goes. I catch myself quicker these days and correct myself and remind myself when I've been judgmental. And and how easy it is to be judgmental and to join in the gossip and to put somebody else down or find fault with, with somebody else. But uh, the kind of love relationship that I, that I desire is a love that never changes and it never varies. The kind of love that you have every time you see a rose. <laughs> You don't want it to be anything other than what it is. Many years ago, in the 1980s, a uh, car pulled up in front of my home in Florida. And um, a woman uh, got out of the car. Her name was Penny. And, and she walked, uh, she was driving, and she walked around and she opened the door and she picked this man up, this older man, and carried him into my home, my wife and I's home. Serena wasn't uh, even born yet. Uh, I think it was 1983. Um, and the man's name is a name that you will recognize, some of you. His name was Ken Kyes, Jr or some people think of it as Ken Keyes, K-E-Y-E-S, Ken Kais Jr. 
And Ken Kais um, had written a book, and he had found out where I lived and came to my home unannounced. And he wanted to talk to me. He had written a book called um, The Handbook to Higher Consciousness. Now, this is a man who in 1946, right after World War II, he was in the war, and he was in Miami, and he contracted uh, polio. And he was rendered uh, paralyzed from his waist down, and part of his arms as well, with this, with this disease that was, um, I mean, I don't know if, how many of you are old enough to remember the polio season. Mm, but um, this was before Jonas Salk and the, uh, polling and the polio vaccine, where almost every classroom in America had one or two students in it that had polio, had this disease that Mariam had in, in Tehran. Um, so here was a man who had written a book called The Handbook to Higher Consciousness, who had been in a body that was paralyzed for 40 years. Okay, and never mentioned it. I had read it. I didn't even know that that he was he was a quadriplegic. He might not have been a quadriplegic technically. He I think he had some movement of his arms, but I can't even remember at this point. But he had a, a beautiful young wife. Her name was Penny, and she was uh, just. And we I had one of the one of those moments that I wrote about in. Um, I can see clearly now. <laughs> Because it was, again, just one of those life-turning moments. And we, um, we talked, well, he had written a book called The Hundredth Monkey, um, and many other books as well. And we talked well into the night and well into the morning. Um, and I was writing at that time about uh, real magic and um, sacred self, and this, I was just sort of getting my feet wet in this whole area of higher consciousness and spirituality. And Ken was someone, it was a handbook to higher consciousness, it's a wonderful book. Uh -huh. And I became very, very close friends with both of them. And um, we came up with that night what uh, we called the four keys, K-E-Y-S, which is his name to higher consciousness, and I want to share them with just what, what uh, I think that they are, um, and what we agreed on, and that I ended up doing some CDs for Hay House on, on this whole theme, and, um, and, this hand, and, and the, the, the keys to higher awareness are basically, um, number one is banish all doubt about who you are. And any information that comes at you, you want to be able to use this, uh, this thing that we call a knowing. A knowing. A knowing means that you have no doubt. Shakespeare said our doubts are our traitors. Um, it's, it's an internal knowing that who I am is divine and capable of manifesting and attracting anything I want for myself in my life. It's a knowing. And whatever it is that comes at me, and this, this really ties in with wishes fulfilled and the five principles of a, placing into your imagination a knowing. Everything that now exists was once imagined. Therefore, anything that is ever going to exist must first be imagined. You cannot create anything for yourself unless you first expect it of yourself. If you don't expect it of yourself, you cannot create it. Because everything that shows up in the physical world is manifested from the world of spirit. In the fourth, 40th verse of the Tao, it says, all being originates in non-being. So into non-being, you must place a knowing. And that's what I tried to tell Betty DeGeneres last night before the phone said no, is don't say, I am healing. I I am healed. I am well. I am well. 
and then you will begin to act upon I am well. It's like I say about becoming an expert. You, de you become an expert by declaring yourself to be an expert and saying, I am an in this area that I feel excitement about. I am an expert in it. By declaring yourself to be an expert in it, you don't have to tell anybody else about your expertise. You don't have to show off about it. You declare yourself to be an expert in it, and then you will act upon that declaration, which is an I am within you, which is God, I am. I am expert. And as you place that into your imagination and live from that place, which is the second of the, of the, of the uh, <coughs> Wishes Fulfilled Foundations, it's a chapter in the book, you will then begin to act upon what is already there. He calls those things which do not exist as though they did. You must call what does not exist yet in the physical world as if it did already. Okay, so it's banishing doubt. The second Ken and I talked about well into the night that night is that you have to cultivate the witness. Cultivating the witness means that you step outside of the physical domain that you are in, you step outside of your physical body and you begin to observe what your body is doing and what you are telling yourself and all of the things that you see out there from the place of non-identification with it. You are the observer. You are the noticer. <clears throat> and as you notice it, you just begin to realize that what it says in quantum physics is true, that when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. And that's a truth, that's a, that's a quantum truth, that the way that you observe something affects what you are observing. That's true in quantum physics. Just the nature of how you observe something changes what you are observing. Our linear mind cannot accept that or wrap itself around that kind of an idea. But in quantum physics, they've got all kinds of proof that when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. The world changes. If you believe you live in a supportive universe that is there to support and be with and, and, and be a foundation for what it is that you want to create, that is what you will attract into your life. That's how the universal consciousness works. The third of these um, uh, <clears throat> higher consciousness principles, the keys to higher awareness, so you banish the doubt, you cultivate the witness, and the third of them is that you tame the ego. And I've talked enough about that here on this, on this ship. Um, you tame the ego, which means that you work, you, it's what I did in the bathroom that I told you about the other day with the, in the toilet, is that you tame the ego, you stop telling yourself, that I am better than, that I have, you know, that I am all of these things, what I own, what I do, what I accomplish, what other people think of me, you, just, you tame that part of you. And you practice what um, Lao Tzu called uh, radical humility. Radical humility. And the fourth is what we're going to do now. It's called shutting down the inner dialogue. That's the fourth key to higher awareness. Banish the doubt, cultivate the witness, tame the ego, shut down the inner dialogue. You've got to go to silence. It's the silence between the notes that makes the music. You cannot create without going there. You, I would encourage you to very strongly make a practice of having some quiet time every single day. Now, the meditation that we're going to do here today is, and by the way, the, the, the fifth, one of the foundations, I think it's the fifth foundation, the eighth chapter in Wishes Fulfilled, is called the last five minutes of the day. And that last five minutes is such a crucial time for you because this is where you are going to program your subconscious mind, which I've talked about before. And as you program your subconscious mind, your subconscious mind is the mind that you go around with that, that determines about 96% of everything that you do. It's just done through this habitual mind process. And you want to really start reversing that, cha making changes in your subconscious mind. The best time to do that 
is five minutes before you go to sleep at night. You do not want to spend the last five minutes reviewing the things you do not want, the things that you do not like, the things that always have been, the things that other people have told you you can't do. You want to let go of all of that and put into your last five minutes, into your imaginations, whatever I am you have as you've banished the doubt and placed it into your imagination. And as you do this, the subconscious mind then goes with the unconscious mind. And this is where you're most amenable to attracting from the universe that which you like, would like to manifest for yourself. You've already said, I am healed, I am well, I am wealthy, I am, and I am happy, I am in a divine relationship, I am, I am, I am, I am. <clears throat> As you go off to sleep and marinate in that for eight hours during the night, when you awaken, the universal subconscious mind of which you are a piece, you are a drop in this ocean, you are a wave on this ocean, it will offer you experiences that match up to what you have placed into your imagination and you will begin to see the right people, the right events, the right circumstances begin to coalesce to bring into your consciousness. It's what's happened, it's been happening to me on this trip every morning at five o'clock in the morning. I just can't wait. When I wake up, I don't ever even think about going back to sleep. I just can't wait to see what, what, what's coming to me now because I go off to sleep tonight saying, I am writing, I am content, I am peaceful, I am absolutely convinced that uh, God is writing this book through me, so I just want to be a good instrument of it. So, we have about 20 minutes left, and what I'd like to do, we'll see how long we do this. Um, a group meditation for 20 minutes sometimes is a problem. But I want to tell you about it. I put it out as a product, and if you can take everything off of your uh, laps and so on, if you can, if you can take your shoes off, that's even better. If you can get... Uh, as grounded as you can. Muktananda said that uh, if you wear sandals or shoes wherever you go, the whole world feels like leather. <laughs> um, so on Maui, where I live, um, we hardly ever wear shoes. Certainly never in the home, but even go going out, even going to restaurants and so on, it's, it's pretty acceptable to just <clears throat> be barefoot. So. Um, I came across this amazing meditation um, a couple of years ago from my friend James Twyman, who's written, he wrote the, a wonderful book called The Moses Code, which I, qu I quoted and wishes fulfilled. And, <clears throat> and he um, has a friend, uh, his name is uh, Goldman, I can't remember his first run, is it? Jonathan Goldman. And Jonathan, uh, yeah, if you want to sit on the floor, that, that's fine too. Um, and what Jonathan, Jonathan is like a sound engineer. I mean, not, not just an engineer, but he's someone that has um, uh, really studied sound. And some, many of you know that I did a meditation years ago called Meditations for Manifesting. It's, call, it's called Japa. Japa meditation is where you use the inner mantra of the repetition of the name of God. It's a meditation that I learned from uh, reading Patanjali and uh, the sutras of Patanjali, practicing them at one time in my life, um, extensively, having miraculous things happen in there. Uh, and the, the idea behind it is that the sound of God, you know, if the opening words in the book of John are, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So the word God is, God, just if you say the word God, it's just God, and so this sound of ah, and so on. So I've done that meditation for years, and it's an amazing meditation because it's a meditation that uh, bridges the gap between the world of spirit and the world of form, um, and it's done through the, through sound. And sound is really, really. I, did, I learned a lot about it when I did the research on that meditation, which was taught to me <clears throat> by, a, by a great teacher in India named Guruji, who found me and was directed and told by his teacher, spiritual teacher Nanda, that uh, I was the person that was to teach this meditation. He wrote me a letter, sent it to me, and then came to meet me, and um, there it was. And, and people have been doing it, doing this job of meditation, but. This meditation is, um, it's an extension of that. 
And what they have done is they took the words, I am that I am, uh, which are the words that Moses spoke, uh, had spoken to him by God at the, uh, on the Sinai, in that holy place. And <clears throat> they took those four letters and, and they looked back to what the alphabet was uh, like at that time of the Hebrew alphabet in the uh, 3300 years ago, 1300 BC, which is the time of the Torah, the time when Moses received this instruction from God, according to the spiritual literature. And they um, equated a sound with each one of those letters. Like if somebody 3,300 years from now were to see the word boat uh, somewhere in one of the hieroglyphic things that we leave behind, they would go B and they would look it up and go B, B means B, 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 O, O, T, T, T. And we would be able to come up with what the sounds are by finding these letters, you see. So that's what they were able to do with these ancient uh, Hebrew scholars and so on. And they came up with the, the sound that would be equivalent to what those letters were. And they reproduced them through a tuning fork until they had it exactly right. How they did this, I don't know. <laughs> All I know is the first time I ever heard this meditation, um, I, uh, and I did it with my children. <laughs> And they just loved it. I mean, Serena Sage was there with me and with her girlfriend, and I put this on, and she said, Dad, I don't want to meditate this afternoon. I said, well, just try it. It's the sound. I want to try it, see how it goes, and come on, do it with me. And so she did, and, and then the next day, uh, we, it was around 4 o'clock in the afternoon, the next day she said, Dad, can we do that one again? And Dad, can we, do it, can we do it again? And we did it again, and now all of my kids have it. They have it, and in fact, the one you're going to play is from Serena's iPhone. Um, because we don't happen to have a copy of the CD. The CD you can purchase um, for a few dollars uh, through Hay House. It's called the I Am Wishes Fulfilled Meditation. It's on Amazon, and you can get it just about anywhere. And there's three tracks. The first track is me explaining it, uh, the s well, six or seven minutes. The second track is uh, a meditation that is not quite as intense. The third is accompanied by a little bit of music. That's the one we're going to play here. So in the, you'll hear the music, you'll hear the guitar music, ding, ding, you'll hear some of that. It's a little bit of chanting with it. But what I want you to listen for is the sound that is behind all of that, the continuous sound. That's the sound of God. That is literally the sound of God speaking to Moses 3,300 years ago, according to all of our scientists that have agreed upon this. And all I know is it's the one I do every single day. I do it 40 minutes in the morning here on this ship. I do it in the afternoon, and I've been doing it at night. <laughs> I've been in a meditation frenzy here on this, uh, on this tour. I think it's because of this wonderful energy that we've all created. So what I'm going to do to add just a little something to it, as at the beginning of it, I'm going to read something. I'd like you to just close your eyes. If we can get the lights off or down um, a little bit. Well, wait, I've got to read something. So wait till I've read it before you do that. <laughs> and, um, and as you listen to the sound, and it's about, um, it's 20 minutes, and it's about 20 after, so that'll take us till 22. I think we're okay in the room. If, so... Um, this is the second, this is the third track, and it's just for a little more active meditation. And what I want you to do in your imagination is to have a piece of paper, and at the top of that piece of paper, I'd like you to write the word that, T-H-A-T. And under, on that piece of paper, put something that you would like to manifest into your life, the person you would like to be, the relationship you would like to have. You can do it for yourself, and yes, you can do it for someone else because we are all one. We all are in coming from and returning to the same vibrational force in the universe. So you can do this for your daughter, you can do it for your healing, you can do it for your job, you can, whatever it is that you would like to attract or manifest, physical or not, I would recommend that you keep the physical out of it, it will all be taken care of, and put it on with the kind of being that you would like to be, that is, inner peace. <clears throat> Because if I give you a wand and say, with this wand, you can have anything you want. And with this wand, you can have inner peace for the rest of your life. No matter what comes your way, which one would you pick? <laughs> Imagine going through your entire life and having, being able to be at inner peace. 
So that's the word that, and underneath it is that, and then when you say I am, you're saying the words of God. So it's I am that. I am. That is, I'm already that. And that's how you... What I do with this, my leukemia, and what Jennifer, what you can do with your cancer and so on, and whoever else is in there, is I am well. I am perfect health. I am God. Okay? And I'm going to read at the beginning of this just a short meditation from uh, the book um, Three Magic Words, the first meditation at the end of the first chapter, which is one of the great pieces of meditation that I've seen. Okay, let's see if I have it. And here we go. Okay, so we'll do about 12 minutes. We have to be out of here in 12 minutes, so we'll do that for 12 minutes. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead, put it on. I know that I am pure spirit, that I always have been, and that I always will be. There is inside me a place of confidence and quietness and security where all things are known and understood. This is the universal mind, God of which I am a part and which responds to me as I ask of it. This universal mind knows the answer to all of my problems. And even now, the answers are speeding their way to me. I needn't struggle for them. I needn't worry or strive for them. When the time comes, the answers will be there. I give my problems to the great mind of God. I let go of them, confident that the correct answers will return to me when they are needed. Through the great law of attraction, everything in life that I need for my work and fulfillment will come to me. It is not necessary that I strain about this only believe. For in the strength of my belief, my faith will make it so. I see the hand of divine intelligence all about me. In the flower, the tree, the brook, the meadow, I know that the intelligence that created all these things is in me and around me and that I can call upon it for my slightest need. I know that my body is a manifestation of pure spirit and that spirit is perfect. Therefore, my body 
is perfect also. I enjoy life, for each day brings a constant demonstration of the power and wonder of the universe and myself. I am confident, I am serene, I am sure. No matter what obstacle or undesirable circumstance crosses my path, I refuse to accept it, for it is nothing but illusion. There can be no obstacle or undesirable circumstance to the mind of God, which is in me and around me and serves me now. If I speak the language of men and of angels, but do not have love, I am a sounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so that I can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I donate all my goods to feed the poor, and if I give my body to be burned, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind, Love does not envy, is not boastful, is not conceited, does not act improperly, is not selfish, is not provoked, does not keep a record of wrongs, finds no joy in unrighteousness but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for language, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. 
When I became a man, I put aside childish things. For now we see indistinctly as in a mirror, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully, as I am fully known. Now these three remained, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. In every moment of your life, you have this choice. You can be a host to God, or a hostage to your ego. Our seminar is over. Namaste. No applause is necessary. Let's leave in silence. I love you all. So this is one of the most exciting and fascinating parts of the world for me. Wanted people to come together in this part of the world that has been so instrumental in all of our teachings. Greece, of course, and all of the great philosophers and thinkers. Italy, Turkey, and Ephesus, and these magnificent places. I thought of it as our spiritual ancestors, that we're all connected, each and every one of us, to everyone who has ever lived. Included people like Socrates and Plato and Diogenes, Rumi and Hafiz. All of these people were from this part of the world. And I really thought it would be wonderful to bring together a collection of people who were interested in these things and to give some lectures on a cruise ship where we could just go from one place in the Mediterranean to the next and see some of these ancient places that are now being excavated where we can actually have the experience of walking through these ancient sites. And seeing exactly how these people who lived in those days and how much they influenced us, all of us, in our lives. In an earlier part of my life, I had spent three or four months living in Turkey and living in Greece and teaching over there back in the 1970s. And I always thought I'd really like to spend some detailed time in there looking at the influence that these people have had that lived at those times on our lives today.
Particularly, I think of them as our spiritual ancestors. One of the great poets of all time, Mevlana Jalaluddin Rumi. And Mevlana means our master in Farsi. Jalaluddin Rumi is his name, and he's considered one of the most popular poets in America today. Imagine that, someone who lived 800 years ago. I've always been a very big history buff. I taught history. That was actually how I got started in this whole world. I was teaching American history back in the Detroit public schools. And it was always something that was very exciting. And then world history. And I've always been fascinated by these great thinkers and philosophers, and what they've offered us and how they've impacted us. So we gathered up 500 people and off we went. So with 500 travelers, we gathered aboard this incredible ship. It's called the Celebrity Equinox. What a magnificent floating city it was. They actually have a lawn at the top deck where you can just go up there and do a little golfing, a little putting if you want to. They have endless numbers of restaurants. I loved the track where I would go out there and walk every single evening and just contemplate what it must have been like to be there a couple of thousand years back. I spent a good part of my time doing my swimming because I like to swim every single day as my form of exercise. They actually have a swimming pool and I would go in there and just do my laps. Then the entire group, 500 of us, gathered in the dining room each night and we participated in group activities outside of the lectures that I gave. It was really great to see how connected everyone was with each other and how many incredible friendships were formulated as a result of being on this trip. People really got to know each other and communicated with each other long after the trip was over. It was a great combination of relaxation and learning. It was a compelling, incredible opportunity on a great, magnificent ship. The very first night we all gathered in one of the beautiful lounges on board this magnificent floating city for a party. And I spoke to all of the group members. They all had an opportunity to meet each other for the first time, but it was very interesting because we had done a similar trip to this called Experiencing the Miraculous a couple of years before this. It was incredible to see how many of the people who had been with us when we went to Assisi and to Lourdes and Medjugorje on that divine trip in those magical places in Europe had decided they had had such a great time in that experience that they wanted to join us again. So many of the people I had known from the past and many of them were renewing old acquaintances. Over the course of the entire 10 days that we were either at sea or in various ports, we visited six different port cities, each with their own unique history and each had their own culture. While we were at sea, we were traveling between ports and there was never a day when we were at sea that I wasn't giving a lecture. I gave actually five lectures at the ship's theater during the entire time. Some of the most fascinating experiences that we had during those lectures and of course they're all here and they're all filmed and you can hear each and every one of them and see exactly what was taking place in the theater. It's almost as if you have an opportunity to be with us on this wonderful cruise through the visitation of our ancient spiritual ancestors.